Now that the Russians have been defeated, we reach the part of the novel where the second edition departs from the first edition. Follow this closely. In the first edition, there is a historical narrative in smaller print after chapter 56, but is still part of chapter 56, where the discussion of the news the Russians have been defeated. When this narrative in small print ends with a source document, document number three, where Russian officials deny that the Germans have won that decisive victory. Then in the next uh, chapter, the first edition, there is a movie script in chapter 57, where we look at the defeated Russians' dead horses on the battlefield and the pitiful collection of Russian soldiers. Again, those numberings are from the first edition. 56, the final defeat and Russian denial. 57, the movie script with another document. In the second edition, the historical narrative that once was part of chapter 56 gets its own chapter, chapter 57, with the heading of 31 August and the source document where the Russians deny that there has been defeated in chapter 57. It is part of 57. The movie script chapter is now chapter 58. And that document, where the Russians admit defeat but vow to continue fighting, appears again in chapter 58. The numbering is different. Let us adopt now the numbering of the second edition. Chapter 59 in the second edition is the same as chapter 57 in the first edition. It concerns Sasha Lenardovich's sister, Veronica and her unwillingness to adopt the revolutionary ways of the family. Veronica's aunts, Agnesa and Adelia, are planning an intervention of sorts to convince Veronica to adopt the revolutionary ways of the family. What takes place in chapter 59 is a debate about how to find meaning in life. The aunts, nuns of the revolution, as Solzhenitsyn calls them, live for the struggle against autocracy, and have no fear that once the autocracy is dismantled, quote, all sorts of opportunities will open up in the cultural sphere as in others, end quote. Veronica wonders to her aunts whether they and their generations have understood what culture is. There is no guarantee in Veronica's view that a revolution would yield salutary political practice or culture. The revolutionary literature of the late 1900s was rather humdrum and dated, after all, the girl holds. The debate between the old radical aunts and Veronica continues, indeed, as they discuss what the rallying to the flag that had commenced as the war commenced could mean. Everyone had betrayed the country, so thought the aunts, as the war began. Even Kerensky had berated the outmoded institutions of Russia, but still argued that the peasants and workers should defend the country first. Veronica had nothing but contempt for those who would just resign in protest of the war. More contempt for these, indeed, than for those who rallied to the flag. The aunts are indignant but their indignance has no effect on Veronica, and she does, quote, not raise an eyebrow, end quote. She is also not raising an eyebrow at the losses of the Russian army. She is not concerned about workers, but rather she wants to sample and consume at the theater, at an evening of poetry, at a lecture on the value of life, or a debate on the problems of sex. At this precise point, the second edition takes a great divergence from the first edition. In the first edition, again, let me emphasize, in the first edition, the next chapter after this debate with the aunts, chapter 58, Veronica and her friend go to the university and meet a traditionalist woman professor who teaches medieval history and who stands against the student revolutionaries. This chapter with the traditionalist professor is chapter 75 in the second edition. What was chapter 58 in the first edition is chapter 75 in the second edition. Remember that the numbering is slightly different in the editions at this point as well. 
what happens in the intervening 15 chapters or so. This is the part that was added to the second edition. These chapters, chapters 59 through 74, are wholly new. In that second edition, Veronica continues her debate with her aunts, and the aunts' debate continues along the same lines through chapter 61, until they come to another debate, a debate over Dmitry Bogrov, the man who shot Pyotr Stolyipin, the reformist prime minister of Russia, from 1906 until Bogorov fatally shot him in September 1911. More on Stolyipin in a moment. In any event, the new chapters added are as follows. Chapter 58, 60, and 61, the aunts continue to debate with Veronica the nature of the revolutionary mindset and the old lady's survey a history of assassinations and attempted assassinations judging them for their social utility and revolutionary fervor. Then they begin chapter 62, talking about the crowning achievement of Russian terrorism, Bogrov's assassination of Stolyipin. But about this there is a debate as well. This debate concerns Bogrov's revolutionary purity. Adel Adelia believes Bogrov collaborated with the Russian security forces to assassinate Stolyipin, which would mean that the assassination was the work of the political right, working through the security services. Agnesa thinks that Bogrov duped the security forces by pretending to collaborate with them, and thus the assassination is the work of the revolutionary left, a great achievement indeed due to the duping and then the gunning down. This chapter on Bogrov is long and tedious, like splitting hairs among ideological compatriots. Then there are more chapters, more new chapters. Chapters 63 and 64 are a history of Bogrov and how he came to assassinate Stolyipin. Chapter 64 ends with Bogrov shooting Stolyipin, in fact. I would say that the upshot of these chapters, if read with careful attention to the interaction between Bogrov and the Russian security forces, would indicate that the security forces were indeed complicit in Stolyipin's assassination. Let's just say that, at best, they were not interested in genuinely protecting Stolyipin, and in fact they were probably orchestrating it, using Bogrov as a dummy. Bogrov may not have collaborated with the security forces, but the security forces did all they could to give Bogrov access to Stolyipin with a gun. The assassination was, in Solzhenitsyn's telling, the work of Russian reactionaries, hoping, perhaps, to undo Stolyipin's reforms. This leads to a long, a very long, a historically long chapter on Stolyipin's statesmanship. It goes from page 529 to 606, 77 pages. And on that last page, page 606, Stolyipin is shot. So the end of chapter 64 is where Bogrov shoots Stolyipin. And at the end of 65, Stolyipin can no longer stand because he has been shot. Much of chapter 65 is in the small print that Solzhenitsyn uses when he is giving straight history, when he is presenting research. In this case, the history is on the statesmanship of Stolyipin. It is a crucial chapter that we will turn to in the next video, for it presents what in, Stolyipin, or in, in Solzhenitsyn's view seems to be the only way Russia could have avoided the debacle at Tannenberg and also the revolutionary collapse of the Romanovs later. Chapter 66 begins to present the story of the novel again. It is a historical interpretation that is pinning the responsibility for the assassination on the security forces. Solzhenitsyn explains why they would be complicit in the assassination. This section spans 66 and a little beyond. Stolyipin dies alone and is unvisited by the Tsar. He has done so much to save in chapter 69. Bogrov is tried in 70 and executed in 71. And let's just say that the establishment is ready to have Bogrov killed without much public testimony so they could not reveal their secrets. 
Then chapter 72 through 74, we get the story of how the Tsar, Tsar Nikolai, reacted to the assassination. Let's just say that he showed clemency. We will have to explore these chapters, including the 100-page chapter on Nikolai and his character that is chapter 74, pages 687 through 784. After this huge chapter 74, we return to the narrative that was where in the first edition and the chapter introducing the medievalist professor. What do we learn in these editions that make up the second edition? We learn about Stoyipin and his reforms, and thus how Russia might have made it out of the morass that it was in during the early 1900s. Stolyipin's successful reforms were cut short by the reactionary right in Russia, which won itself rule by the Tsar, and hence disaster. We learn about Russia's sovereign and why he was not fitted for rule. This theme of the Tsar's incompetence for rule mirrors much of the story we have seen up to this point in the battle. Let us look to Stolyipin in the next video, and then the Tsar in the video after that, before picking up the narration in the video after that. We will look at chapters 65 and 74 for the most part, with the idea that we might save you the trouble of reading those ginormous chapters.